recording right now. OK, so students have asked me what's the best way to study, and I made a video called how to study for this class. Um, if you take those topic pages in conjunction with your textbook, which 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and you don't necessarily have to annotate every page, but you know what those annotations are meant to do. They're meant to show you the, uh, they're meant to connect the content you've learned with the way the questions are going to be asked on this. So that's the best way to study. If there's something in one of the topic pages you don't know, the textbook named after that same topic has all the content from that. So that's the best way to, to, to study. If you were not virtual, I, I think the best way to study is to get in a group of people. So you could do that virtually, I guess, with a video meeting, but studying with another person is very helpful because you hear what they're saying. And, you know, they'll remember things that maybe you didn't. So that's that's an important thing. But your best strategy is to look at the topic pages and um, if there's something there you don't know, look to the textbook that has the same chapter, the same number. So I'm going to I'm going to share my screen right now, and this is probably the most important thing I'm going to talk about today. I want to get you familiar with some some things about um, about the questions that will throw you off if you don't know this. So you, you may have seen this in the personal progress checks you've done. So let me uh, let me share my my screen here so all right, can you somebody just give me a shout out can you see two maps can you see a map here yeah yes okay. yeah thank you so um I, I don't i don't see any map i don't know why oh wait now i do i see okay probably... okay now i do all right it was just delayed i guess okay so um Typically, a student will look at this. This is the stimulus for a question. Um, on the AP test, every question set has a stimulus. It's something you have to read or a map to look at or a photograph or a picture or something like that. And you answer roughly about three questions that have you engaged with that stimulus. So in this case, it's two maps. Um, this is called the attribution line right here that gives you information about it. And that's 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 pretty important. And by the way, on the test that you're going to take on Friday, there are some questions that don't have stimulus. They're just, I want to know, you know, do you know the content? So, you know, what's the difference between the political structure of the Aztec and the Inca? That's a very simple question. You should know that one is very decentralized. The Aztecs are very decentralized. Remember, they use tribute and human sacrifices to keep places in order where the Inca has a bureaucracy and they unify. So those types of comparison things. Um, so uh, you will get some just basic content questions, unlike the AP test. But let's look at this for a second. So um, I remember I gave this on a test a few years ago. It says typical sailing routes and schedules of Omani merchants um, traveling all right there. So. Omani merchants are from a country today, a place today in Arabian Peninsula called Oman. And a typical response is the students might look at this and say, oh my gosh, we never learned about Omans or Omani. We never learned about that. As a matter of fact, Omani is repeated in the question that's pertinent to these. But I, I want you to know, you're probably going to see that on a lot of items on the AP test where something is named or something's in a text you have to read that it was not part of the required content. But you can still do the question because the questions here have to do with generalities about Indian Ocean trade, and it doesn't matter who the merchants are. So the fact that these are Omani merchants is completely irrelevant to you being able to answer this question. OK, teachers and students. This is time for the transition. If you're in a homeroom and you need to transition to a grade level appropriate Bulldog Best homeroom, you may transition now. This is the bell to transition. Ding, ding. All right. We're announcement crazy at Central. It drives me nuts. Anyway, so let's look at the question. I'm gonna look, we'll look at three questions that pertain to this. Um, Five minutes. Students, please get there quickly. It's a five-minute transition. We will begin at 10:15 with Bulldog Best, grade level appropriate. 
All right, see what I mean? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's look at the question. You had these two maps, and one tendency would be for students to look at this and say, okay, let me see. One is right here, and that's where they're going to be in November, and these merchants are going to be in two. They're going to be here by December, or November, December. Then they're going to move down to three. You know, the specifics of this aren't really important. The point is that merchants are having to move around in patterns at different times in the year. Even Omani merchants, even Chinese merchants, Swahili merchants, it doesn't matter. So that's what you have with these two stimuli. And they simply say the same, they say the same thing. Um, you see months of the year where they can go this direction and months of the year when they go this direction. And whether it's November or July, it doesn't matter. You just get a general idea from this. So let's look at some questions here. I'm going to put a question up and I want you to read it and just try in your mind to come up with the answer. So I think I think that's not, uh, hopefully that's big enough for you to see that there are the particular routes and timings of the voyages depicted on the maps best reflect which of the following characteristics of Omani merchants. So just take a look at A, B and C and without saying anything in your mind, select the right answer. I'll give you about a few seconds here. I got to get the door while you're figuring. Sorry, Sorry. 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 I'm so sorry. I got to just... No, it's okay. I mean, I was. Just... Were you in my room last time? Yeah. Oh, they go to Mr. Ball's room. There is. I'm <laughs> over there. Are you being. I'm doing whatever you can come in here come on. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm doing a live session with FBA, so you know. But anyway, I'm alive, so okay, sorry about that. So um anyway, I, I hope you have something in your head and we, I'm gonna go through this for a second. And I want to tell you something about these questions. Um when these questions are crafted, and this is a question from an actual AP test. When these questions are put together, the wrong answers, which are called distractors, um have to be have to have a level of plausibility. In other, in other words, you're not going to see something that is absolutely just stupid. They're going to be plausible. So if you look at these, I mean, if you look at D, their control, the question again is, um, these routes reflect which of the following characteristics of Omani merchants. D says their control of the sources of grain needed by the Chinese in East African cities. That's just not true. Um, because China had chompa rice, they had huge surpluses, the Grand Canal, everything else. So we'll write that off. Um, C says their need to avoid the routes traveled by the faster and better armed Portuguese trading ships. And that cannot be true because we haven't even studied the Portuguese yet. They don't come into the Indian Ocean in this time period. Had this been after 1450, possibly, but that one's not true. Um, I hope the one that stood out, and by the way, A is kind of the best wrong answer. B is the answer here. Um, their advanced knowledge of Indian Ocean currents and monsoon wind patterns, which if you um, did the readings, that one should have just stood out to you. So the answer to this one is, is B. All right. So I hope you got V. Um, let's look at another question on the very same uh, topic right here. Based on the maps and your knowledge of world history, which of the following best describes the effect of the spread of Islam on Indian Ocean trade? So look at A, B, C, and D, and in your mind, try to come up with what you think the answer is. Attention teachers and students, everyone should be in your old bed homeroom. Uh, teachers, you may begin with 11. Thank everybody so much for all your cooperation. Uh, we think today is going to be a great day for the lessons. And uh, have, everybody have a great rest of your day. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, yeah.
All right, I'm going to tell you something about um, this one. The answer here, by the way, the answer is A. And what's interesting about this answer, and it's, it's true of other, um, a lot of the questions, is that's a direct quotation from one of the historical developments on the topic page. And I can tell you, you're going to see that on the AP test. Um, you're going to see where that statement, it, it, it's difficult to write these questions, but um, oftentimes the historical development that you see, the historical developments are pretty much the answer key to the test. So it led to the expansion and intensification of commerce along already existing trade routes. So that was that one's pretty easy. I you might be sidetracked um, with another one. And by the way, on 22, if you put A, I can kind of see that, but it's just not clear whether Ramadan will really affect trade. But you absolutely know for question 22 that they had to know the monsoon wind patterns. That was the absolute best answer. So um, A is just a quote from the historical development. So we'll look at the last one. Mr. Henderson, Yes. why wouldn't it be D? Because it was not the first trade links. Um, in, uh, and this was on a, that's a great question, by the way, and I can explain why you're confused about it because this is from a previous AP test when students had to learn everything from Roman and Han times all the way, you know, the whole thing. I think I mentioned before that just last year they cut the course at 1200. So we used to start with 8000 BCE and you might not. Maybe that's not a fair question because we didn't study before 1200. So had we studied it, you would have known that those trade links were already there and this said that they were previously isolated. So it, I think if you put D, I could, it's justifiable why you put that. And you probably wouldn't see this on the AP test today since you wouldn't study anything before 1200. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. OK, so don't, you know, I can understand that. Um, Wait, was it 8000 8, BC or 800? No, OK, nothing. This this is not understand. This isn't relevant right now, but I know I'm just asking because it was eight thousand is a long time. Eight, it, it used to be it used to, start in, it used to start in eight thousand, but you went through that very quickly because there's not a lot known about that time. We just studied. Uh -huh. If you remember my uh -huh. um, unit zero, we looked at just basic river valleys in the Neolithic Revolution. That's basically what that was. We went, and then you got up to the Roman, Greek, and Han stuff. So, yeah. all right. So um, let's look at the next one. Twenty-four. Which of the following factors contributed the most to Omani traders' ability to undertake the voyages depicted on the maps? Again, you don't have to know anything about Omanis, but you know they're in the Indian Ocean. So, come up with an answer through A, B, C, and D. Um, this one should jump out at you, and I think you'll see why had you do the uh, a positive pages. Um, the answer here is B, the astrolabe and the latine sail. Um, that contributed, they contributed the most to their ability to do these journeys. So um, you had to learn about the Latine sail. It was a sail that allowed them to go against monsoon winds and free them up. And the astrolabe told them latitude, helped them find themselves on a map. So, uh, so that's that's the answer. The answer there. Really, remember it can't be A because there's not a single caliphate. Islam was split into several Turkish, Turkic-speaking smaller civilizations, and Arabic's not relevant to this and the innovations in agriculture 
No. <clears throat> so I hope most of you saw Astrolabe and Latine Cell, excuse me, <clears throat> and and chose and chose that one. So let me let me make a statement about um, these types of questions in general. And this is true of the AP test. It's also true of the test that I write for you. Um, please know that you're not expected to get all of these questions right. On the AP test, questions range from the extremely easy to those questions that are so difficult it's almost impossible to get them correct because the idea isn't to create you know a 90 to a 100 is an A and I don't do that on this test either. The purpose on these these questions is to be able to compare students with students to make a fair test so they can really it's very complicated but it's so it's so that a four or five a three four or five on the AP test remains same every year even as the natural difficulty of the test increases or decreases. So just know that you're not expected to know them all. And I don't I don't curb it, but I have a formula. So on the actual AP test, I mean, if you make a 60, 65 percent on the if you get about 65 percent of the questions right on the multiple choice, on the AP test in May, you're probably going to get a four, possibly a five on the AP test. So. I don't want you to get freaked out if you're going through this and you see something you just can't figure out. Also, I'm going to give you some. Uh, there's actually research on students taking tests, believe it or not. Um, the research shows that if a student is prepared, now if you, you haven't done anything, you haven't studied this, isn't relevant, but if the student is prepared and they see a question and one of them stands out as being the right answer, you should probably go with that. Because what tends to happen, especially with AP kids who tend to be more conscientious about grades, they'll sit there and they're second guess that question. Like maybe it's another one and they'll analyze it to death and then they'll erase the bubble and change it to something else. And I can tell you over 80 percent of the time when you change an answer from the first one that you thought it was, you're going to change it from a correct to an incorrect answer. You maybe have experienced that in school before, but there's real research. There's a science called psychometrics that studies student test taking. Um, changing your answer does not, it is usually not a good thing. Also, some of the questions have um, long reading passages that require longer amounts of time. Those don't count any more than a simple question. They all count the same. So if you're really hung up on one, um, just, just uh, you know, it's not going to count any more than another question. So those are two things you, you need to keep you need to keep in mind. So there is um, some sample questions and let me tell you how the. Uh, <clears throat> let me tell you how the test is going to be set up. So what I did, I wrote. I'm still finishing up the test. I wrote about five to nine questions for each topic. So 1.1 has you know, five to nine. 1.2 is long. That has, I know, nine or 10. And uh, it goes all the way through 2.6. And so they're like pools of questions. Um, you're not going to answer all those questions. It's going to draw randomly from each pool. So the questions on 1.1 that you get will be different than the questions on 1.1 that another student gets. And they'll all be in a different order. Um, so I, I'm looking at about 40 questions that you'll actually write. It may be less, 35 to 45 within that range questions that you'll actually do, but they'll be selected randomly as you go through it. And um, probably you can guess the obvious reason for that is um, I don't, probably not you guys who cared enough to come and watch today, but there's a ton of cheating that goes on and um, I <clears throat> anyway, I just know it and you know it and uh, my, my students just tell me, yeah, there's tons of cheating. So I'm I'm the teacher who cares because it's not going to help you in May. I don't want you to have a A in this class and then make a two on the AP test, which is what cheating will do. So I've set the test up. The test is timed 
but it's set to give you adequate time. You can take it any time on Friday. That's that's the only lesson on Friday. It's, I mean, this is a light week in assignment, so you can be studying for it. You can take it any time Friday, but when you start, the timer starts. And I don't have the time yet of how long you have because I don't know how many questions it will be. On the AP test, you have a minute a question. So it's 55 multiple choice questions. You have 55 minutes. You don't really need a minute a question on this because some of the questions don't have any stimulus to read. Some of them are just, you know, which of the following empires did this? And that should take you about 10 seconds if you know the material. But I don't want you to get stressed out about time. The time isn't to rush you. The time is just make to make it so one student doesn't leave their test open for hours while his friends are taking it elsewhere, waiting till they get the same question and can group me the answer, you know, that type of thing. So it will be timed. Um, and uh, it won't be graded on a raw percentage. I will use my calculation. So don't be stressed if you hit some questions that you find difficult. It's fine. Um, I I looked the, the the for the people who have done the progress checks. Um, I've looked at the information and the data, and I'll be honest with you, I'm very pleased. You know that's not a great. I hope you didn't look at the book when you did it, because that tells me that you got the stuff down, and I don't. That means the lessons are working and it means that, um, you know, you don't really. It, it means you're well prepared and I don't want to think you're well prepared if you're not. But what I'm saying is the scores are really good. So that's telling me that this is working and uh, I'm very pleased with how strong the grades were that they were the weakest in one point. Three, I think, which was states in Southeast Asia and Indian Ocean, and I can understand that because the questions that you got were, were really skill based questions. You had to read something from a historian and ask about, you know, well, the argument means this. It wasn't really about Sri Javara, which is something that was in the John Green video you watched. So anyway, I'm, I'm very pleased with with the re results on that. So um, that's the nature of the test. Um, I, if you were here last week, I'm, I'm, and I would, this came up last week, I'm having a really hard time convincing myself to set the tests to where you can go back and visit previous questions that you answered. And it's not that I think that's a bad thing. It's just it's going to open the door to, to people, you know, being dishonest because it, 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 anyway. Um, so I haven't made a decision. I think last time I said since on the AP test, you're allowed to go back. You know, it's a paper test. I'll let you do this, but I, I'm not. Um, because of some cheating things that have happened. Um, on non test. Um, I, I'm second guessing that so just to let you know, and it'll be very clear instructions on what's allowable and how the test will proceed when you take it. Um, if you have any questions in the next few days, I'm um, starting tomorrow. Um, I'll I'll be in Pennsylvania, but I will be accessible through its learning. So just know that. Just know that. All right, I'm going to open it up now to any of you that have questions or comments or anything you would like to uh, you would like to ask about the test or anything else. So, got it, Mr. Henderson. Yes. Um, if we are an FBA student enrolled in Forsyth Central High School, does that mean that um, we have to be in AP World History zero for like the AP classroom? Yes. If you are a central, if your base school is central, um, and that is, it, it's just a big stinking. I, I'm embarrassed every time I send a message about this because it, it, they changed it, as you know. But you should be in. I think it's FEA AP World. It's a period zero P or P -E or zero. That is if you're a central student. If you're not in that, um, we're going to fix all this. We're going to fix all this. Um, matter of fact, I think I just sent out a Google form and survey everybody. I, the as you know, the learning path had you go back and check that. So let me ask you, are you a central student? Yes, but I'm in the FEA class, like the one that I'm not supposed to be. OK, OK, so I'm going to make a Google survey and send it out and have every 
online student, give me your name, what your base school is, and what class you're in, and we will fine tune this. So I, I many apologies for this mess. It's not on you. It's not your fault. They've changed the code, um, gave us a new code. So uh, that's the deal on that. So we'll, we'll get that squared away. OK, we still have time before the registration for the AP test is absolutely finalized. So I, I will fix that. Um, or reach out, reach out to you guys. What I would do right now is um, focus on studying for the for the AP test, OK, for the Friday. And I have one more question um, on History Haven. How can we access like, you know, in the, in the AP Worldpedia, how can we access like each unit's like website? OK, so I wrote, I started writing AP Worldpedia when the course looked a lot different. And um, they used to have these things called key concepts that went from 8000 BCE all the way to the present. When they cut the course in half, they rearranged it. They don't even call them key concepts anymore. They call them topics. And I simply have not writing that. It's like writing a PhD. And I ha just haven't had time to restructure it. So I um, mean, it's it's a useful tool. Um, I have 1.1 and 2.3 Indian Ocean Trade are the only ones that I've compiled. Basically, I'm cut and pasting from all where they used to be and combining them together in the topics. So that's I, I don't really have a, an answer for you because I'm not I'm not done with it. Okay. In, well, in that okay. regard, sure. And in that regard, your textbook should fill things in. That's mm -hmm. the best that we have is your textbook. Uh, you know, I don't really like it that much, but it, it does give you the straight up content, I think. Well, OK, thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. Anyone else? Can you explain the Bhakti movement? The what? The Bhakti movement? Yep, it's on page 27 of your textbook. Here's what the Bhakti movement was. It First of all, how it fits into this course, the Bhakti movement is the an example of the spread of belief systems when they go into new areas and blend with what's already there. So a lot of most major belief systems today are mixtures of culture. So Christianity in the United States is really different than Christianity in Ethiopia because it's taken on characteristics of U.S. culture. Um, for example, Christmas. All right. It's a it's a celebration of of gifts and very materialistic, which is quite different than, you know, what it would have looked like in Palestine a long time ago. So Bhakti movement is kind of like that. It's um, it's it, it simply means faith, I believe, and I believe in Sanskrit or Indian language. But Bhakti is when Hinduism spread to Southeast Asia, which was Buddhist, it blended with Buddhism and becomes this their word here is syncretic. Syncretic means the mixture of two different cultures. So the Bhakti movement blended Buddhism and Hinduism so, um, so much that Bhakti temples, you couldn't really tell if you're in a Buddhist or a Hindu temple. It was the mixture of this, the two beliefs. So what it looks like in the um, curriculum is an example of how belief systems change as they spread. And of course, when it absorbs the things from other beliefs, it's more acceptable to people because it's not as specific. OK, so the example of that in Islam is a very informal form of Islam that focuses not on the strict doctrines of the Quran, but more on your experience and the feelings you have about Allah. Does anyone want to tell me what that form of Islam is? Because it had a lot to do with its spread. You should know this. Is that like the Sufi? Perfect. It's Sufi, a, a Muslim. The name of a Muslim in this movement is called a Sufi, and the movement is called Sufism. Now, Sufism in the topic pages um, are a cause of the spread of Islam. It was kind of, I don't want to say it was watered down Islam, because that makes it feel like it's not a real faith, but it is a real faith. But what it is, it's less specific. So you don't have to be as strict, and it will absorb other cultures and that makes it more acceptable to people who don't want the strictness of a religion. So Sufism, this mystical form of Islam helped it spread. So I, Sufism and the Bhakti movement are good 
examples of things to know, but I believe it's page 27 in your textbook it says the Bhakti movement in bold print and tells basically what I just told you. So didn't the Sufi movement like conform to local people's beliefs and things? It yes. Kind of adapted? Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, and, and Sufis believe you shouldn't own things, uh, almost like monks. Um, and so they didn't own homes, which meant they were always traveled. And since they traveled, they carried Islam with them from place to place, and that helped it spread. And the fact that you just mentioned that it was easily blendable with local um, culture. Um, I wanted to clarify something. So the Incas, did they, they also used a tributary system, but it just didn't affect their government as much as it did for the Aztecs. Okay, great question. The Inca, that, okay, the Aztecs, that was their method of exploiting conquered provinces. And remember the provinces in the Aztec empire kept a lot of their independence. And by the way, some, the Aztec is the name of the empire, the people who called them Mexica. And sometimes those are interchangeable. But here's the Inca. The Inca would conquer an area, but they centralized it under bureaucracy. And yes, they taxed, but what they did is they, they demanded that conquered regions send up human labor in the form of tribute. So they'd ha so let's say Georgia was conquered. Georgia would have to send up, uh, or let's say Forsyth County was conquered. Forsyth County would have to send up, let's say, a percentage of its male population to do labor for a contracted amount of time, let's say for a month. And then that segment of the population comes back, and then another group of men go and work, and it cycles like that. It's a rotating cycle of labor, and that's called the MITA system, M-I-T-A. And that's in your textbook, too. You can, you know, you can, it, by the way, if you go to AP Worldopedia and go to the search box, that's one quick way to get to stuff. You can put MITA there, and it'll take you right to it, or the index in the back of your textbook. The MITA, MITA system was a tribute system that instead of paying wealth, you paid labor, and that's what the Inca focused on. And that's worth mentioning because when we get to the next unit, the Spanish will come in and see it and think it's great and they'll use it, but they'll for force all the, the Inca to provide labor for them and it will spread disease to a horrible effect. So that's the tribute system of the Inca. Okay, thank you. And also, um, what civilizations gave women the most rights? Was it Islam? Okay, it's an interesting thing about Islam, because originally <clears throat> Islam wasn't as strict on women as some people think it was. If you remember Muhammad, his wife was the owner of the caravan he worked for. I mean, his wife was his boss, let's just put it that way. But when Islam spread into, um, and this is before 1200, but when it spread into areas like Mesopotamia, where they were, Mesopotamians are the one who used to veil their wives. So that tradition was not original to Islam that came from Mesopotamia, but then when it becomes Turkic, and that's what really Islam is in this time period, and splits up into several Turkic regions, like the Seljuks and the Ottomans, it absorbs the regular Turkic kind of view and it becomes patriarchal or a little stricter on women. The civilization that really gave women um, a lot of rights in this time period were the Mongols. Because you even have one time when a Mongol Khanate died and his wife ruled for a while, you would not have that in almost every other civilization. And women were um, performed jobs in society. They usually pulled those yurts um, and they were respected. And, and it's probably because the Mongols were agricultural. Remember, patriarchy or male dominated societies um, come in when human beings become farmers and stay put for reasons I described in one of the earliest videos. So the Mongols are pretty open. Also, Sub-Saharan Africa. African women could be businessmen, they could make contracts with other male businessmen, and they didn't dress as fully, you know, they basically didn't wear a lot of clothes up top, you know. And um, in the Arab world, for Arab Muslims, that was just uncalled for. So, matter of fact, when Ibn Battuta, the traveler you're gonna deal with, when he goes to sub-Saharan Africa, he's appalled. It's like, what's the deal? Your women should be at home, you know? And he's, I mean, if, you, if you read that thing called Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta, the merchant and the pilgrim, you'll see that Ibn Battuta, Ibn Battuta had some really 
negative attitudes about the place, places that he went to because he didn't like their culture and how they they gave women a, a upper kind of level in society. So Sub-Saharan Africa did not subjugate women as much as other areas. But in the Turkish caliphates, women don't have rights. In Western Europe, women don't have as, as many rights. Um, and in China, any time you have Confucianism, Confucianism is, is patriarchal. Remember, it believes in hierarchies. And the man is always above the woman in Confucianism. So. Okay. What about the Mayans and the Aztecs? It's a good question. <laughs> the Mayan. It's a good question. Did this come up? Is that one of the questions in the back of your book, in the chapter in your book? Because someone else asked me that question, a student. Is that is that question coming up in something? Um, there were, I found some practice things on your website. Okay. And so while I was going okay. through those, yeah. Oh, is, it, is that on the It's Learning page where there was like a test? No, I just went on your website and I found up uh, practice questions. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah. that's a good question. I, I, I have to, it's kind of embarrassing when I can't answer a question you found on my own website. So, But the good news is if I don't know it, it's not on the test. Okay, so. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. And also, I, this is the last thing I'll ask. Um, on the on the quiz last week, I got a question and it was about the Trans-Saharan trade route. Mm -hmm. And it asked if um, mostly luxury goods were sold on the Trans-Saharan trade route. Was that just the Silk Road or also the Trans-Saharan trade route? Okay, was this a, que a question on the um, personal progress check? No, it was on the basic concepts quiz. Okay. okay. The way I usually teach this is that the, the Silk Roads focus only on luxury goods. Um, Trans-Saharan salt, which is not really luxury, slaves, but then gold. So there was, there was some aspect of luxury items on the Trans-Saharan. Um, I... I Almost every student in my face-to-face -face classes missed a question on the personal progress check that asked, it was a quotation about Indian Ocean trade. And the question asked, which was most likely to be spread on this trade route? And one of the answers was bulk items such as coal, which I hated that question because the Indian Ocean trade did focus on bulk items, but not coal, because this is before fossil fuels were used. And the confusion was, the Indian Ocean trade, Trans-Saharan trade, focus on um, luxury and sometimes non-luxury items. The Silk Roads was almost exclusively just luxury because it was so difficult to cross and so expensive to travel. People only traded things that were very light and very valuable, like gems and silk. So um, just understand in the other trade routes, like Indian Ocean, just because it can deal with bulk items. A bulk item would be cotton, things that you need a lot of before it's valuable, or timber. You know, you're not gonna drag trees across the Silk Road. Those were perfectly suited for Indian Ocean trade, but don't think Indian Ocean trade didn't also deal with gems and silk and spices, which were often luxury goods. So I, I don't know if I answered your question. Was your question specifically about Trans-Saharan trade? Yeah, the I I didn't know. I was having a hard time picking between two options. One of them was that it was mostly um, Muslim merchants, and one of them was that it had luxury goods. Okay. I can tell you the answer. I'm glad you asked because you might get something like that on Friday. The Trans-Saharan trade was dominated by Muslims. Okay. Yeah, and you might see that on the test too. Okay. <laughs> and what about the – was the Indian – um, trade route also dominated by Muslims? Indian Ocean, the majority of merchants were Muslim. There, okay. Remember, there's a great diversity there, much more diversity than Trans-Saharan because you do have Hindus and Buddhists and Chinese, but Islam and Muslims were the majority. They kind of made it what it was. So. Okay, thank you. Huh? Was Admiral, like, 
Zhang He, the person that like went around on like a diplomatic voyage yes. and like claimed territories for China. Is that right? He he wasn't to claim territories like the Spanish would do after Columbus, where they'd say this all belongs to the king. But what he what he was trying to do is to create the context here. China used to be this incredibly powerful situation that powerful empire that had tribute relations with the areas around it that they used, you know, for trade. And then the Mongols took over and destroyed all that. Well, when Zheng He, Zheng He, when he comes along, China had just broken free from the Mongols and they wanted to get back to being what they were before. And so they sent him out and he went to these cities to try to create tributary relations with him. Yeah, he went all the way to Swahili city states. And there's an entry of Zhang He on AP Worldopedia link 2.3 that I created. I think the very bottom thing just explains about what he was doing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, in the Indian Ocean trade and like other trades, uh, what are the most important cities of trade that we should know for the test? Indian Ocean trade. Um, Okay, I know collectively about the Swahili city-states. Um, they're important because they're independent states. They're not under any government. And just the fact that their language, Swahili, is a mixture of African and Arab, Arabic being the language of Islam, shows you how into, that there, it's a combination of Islamic contacts. Muslims constantly went into those ports. And it sustained a kind of a pure practice of Islam there. Um, I did mention, I can't remember if we did in the live session last week, I mentioned Kilwa. Um, Kilwa is about as far as you could go in a single monsoon season. So that became an important one. But if, if you want specific names, no Malacca. Um, Malacca is on the end of the Malay Peninsula. And it was important for the spice trade because all the little islands that were too small for big ships to go around would all export their spices to Malacca where they were packaged for large vessels. So I mean, Malacca definitely, but you don't need a comprehensive knowledge of all of them, but I would know that most of the cities were port cities and um, very diverse in their culture. Unlike European cities, which weren't diverse, um, the cities in Europe, Remember, Europe has a unified Christian Catholic civilization. And what you have in the Indian Ocean is cities where you have to have diversity if you want to trade. It attracts the incredible amount of cultures in the Indian Ocean to want to do business there. So Malacca. What about um, the Silk Road? Silk Road, well, one of the um, a positive, um, one of the a positive connections you did had Samarkand, which was a huge trade city on the Silk Roads in what is today Uzbekistan, I believe. Um, Xi'an is the capital, was the capital of Song, China. That's what it's called today. And it was like the end of the Silk Road trade, the e farthest eastern end. But I'm not going to ask a question where I'm going to specifically you need to know Samarkand. I'll ask a question where I might mention Samarkand and you just need to know the function that cities played in the Indian Ocean, or excuse me, on the Silk Roads. Much like you saw Omani merchants, um, but you knew enough about Indian Ocean trade to, to see what the answers were. So um, I'll, I'll tell you this, if the thing is in the illustrated if, if a word is in the illustrated examples um that's not those aren't hard and fast requirements they're good if you have to have to write an essay which we're going to talk about later but if something's in the blue box under the historical development like caravanserai that's that means question writers can specifically ask questions about that so i would know about um the function of cities. The Silk Roads, I'm having a hard time writing questions on the Silk Roads. I only have like four or five on topic 2.1 because basically here's the Silk Roads. 
new technologies such as the Caravanser I helped overcome environmental barriers to trade. Money helped. China was a big deal. Um, that's, cities grew because of trade. And that's that's basically it for 2-1. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you this, since you all are tuning in, almost every question on the Mongols comes from my podcast, can be found on my Mongol podcast. So did I answer um, your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, do we have to know any like major thing that continued on because of the Indian Ocean Exchange? Anything that continued? Yeah, like, I forgot the word. Continuity? Uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> continuities, um, in this time period, continuities would be that Indian Ocean trade continued to, first of all, be dependent upon monsoons, but also that they continued to diffuse, that you hear that word a lot in AP world, it means to, to spread out. Okay. Trade continued to diffuse religion. And here's where the bhakti would come in. The diffusion of religion in Indian Ocean trade led to like the bhakti movement, which blended Buddhism and Hinduism. So that would be a continuity. But other than that, I don't think there's no great surprise in terms of continuities for Indian Ocean trade. Okay, cool. They're great questions, by the way. For the Crusades, besides um, that, there was an increase in trade. What were the other effects of it? Was, was feudal, did feudalism stop? Um, feudalism actually, no. For the Crusades in this class, you need to know that it brought Christian Christianity into direct conflict with Islam, and that became the beginning of trade relationships back and forth. It would make kings, there are other things about the Crusades, but since the Crusades start before 1200, although they'll come into 1200 a little bit, we don't go into as much detail as we used to about the Crusades. They did weaken feudalism a little bit, but for the most part, you have feudalism through this, throughout this whole, throughout this whole time period. So the main thing about the Crusades, and I do believe there's one or two questions, you know, I'm saying there's one or two questions about the Crusades. That doesn't mean you might, you'll get that because they're randomized. Mm -hmm. Um, but that would fall under the section on Europe, 1.6. So the trade connection is basically the most important thing about the Crusades. And I didn't see much uh, in the book about this. I might be saying it wrong, but is there anything we need to know about the Byzantine Empire? Uh, Byzantine, uh, the Byzantine Empire does not show up in the course description. Um, if there's a question about the Byzantines, because you'll see questions about it on old tests when we had to teach it. Um, Byzantines are just half of the Roman Empire. If there's a question about the Byzantines on the AP test, there will be enough information in the text you read where you can answer it. I'll tell you this, on the test you're taking Friday, they're not mentioned once. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I was signed up for the wrong AP classroom. Am I still able to take the progress check? Yes. A matter of fact, um, even if you're in the wrong class, if you have access to one, go ahead and take it because I can still see it. And we'll worry about getting the classes right. I, I, someone else asked this. I'd l I think the best strategy is for you to focus on, on getting prepared for the test on Friday. But if you have access to a progress check, just by all means, please go ahead and take it. It's not going to mess anything up. I'll still see it, but I do need to get you like, no later than the end of next week. Yeah, I uh, I put in the right code yesterday after the survey thing, so I'm out of the wrong one now. Okay, so did the code work, by the way? For me, it did. Okay, very good. Is that, okay. Attention teachers and students, that bell represents uh, time for a transitioning gift. A student has a pass from another teacher. This is still homework. If you do not have a pass, you must remain in your Bulldog best grade level appropriate homework. Uh, so that's what that bell will signify. There will be another bell that will come on and signify when they should be in that class after the transition. Thanks, everybody. Okay.
Okay, and on my little panel here, I see that someone raised their hand. Is that Zara? Is your... Oh. Okay, anyone? So I'll just ask, does anybody else have any, any more questions? So for the progress checks, are there two of them or just one? No, you do. Um, the progress checks, there's one for unit one, which should have been done last week unless you're having problems. So there's one for yeah, unit two. Um, so unit one and unit two, just the multiple choice, which I think that's all I turned on, just multiple yeah. choice. Yeah. Okay. On the progress check, there was a question on like Vedic religions. Mm -hmm. Why is Buddhism uh, a Vedic religion? Okay. Again, the weakness of the progress. Okay. The Vedic time period was when um, it's actually before. How to put this? The the Vedas are Hindu scriptures, and um, Hinduism is a Vedic religion. Did the progress re did the progress report indicate that Buddhism was a Vedic religion? No. Okay, so it, it, you can be a complete excuse for not knowing that question because the Vedas are see that's an old question from when we used to test the whole time period. The College Board didn't really screen or vet these questions too well when they made this because a lot some of them make reference to things you would have learned before 1200. The Vedas are um, Hindu kind of scriptures and poems and Hinduism is a Vedic religion because it comes out of the Vedas. So that's the deal with that. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. So let me let just generally, how's the course going? Do you feel like you're getting it? Is, are the, the things that we're doing? I mean, I want to make sure you get a rock solid AP World History course. And my goal is for you guys to have this, if you stay all year, to do just as well as my face to face students. So how's it going? Do you, do you feel like you're being prepared or is there anything I can do? To do better. For me, um, it's going fine as I'm reading the book and um, understanding everything and the readings help and um, the podcast really helped explain a lot of stuff and especially Crash Course. Um, I feel like, can you like um, do more like live like sessions like you did last week and explain and like teach? J absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll do one next week. OK, and this one's like gone an hour now, which I think is good. That's not a lot for a whole week. And it's it'll, it, this one's recording. I actually, remember to record this one so it will be available. So I, that's a great idea and I will do that. Yep. Um, and by the way, um, so you may have found this already. For, you, you're going to find resources online all over the place. Just know that some of them aren't good. Some of them make reference to things that you don't have to know anymore because this course has just changed so much. But I want to mention one guy. You may have found this dude already on YouTube, um, Steve Heimler. He's got something called Heimler's History, and I may have linked it in the in the uh, I may have linked it in the uh, learning path. But he has a little short 10 minute, 15 minute review videos. He has a video for every topic, like 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. And he has a review video for 1200 to 1450 that, that reviews the whole things in nine or 10 minutes. So Steve, I can tell you, Steve lives not too far from here, by the way, he lives in Kennesaw and his videos are good. So you, you can use his. There's another guy named Ben Freeman, and he has a website called Freemanpedia, and he made he basic he just made a YouTube channel, and he's making YouTube videos just on illustrative examples. Like this, he has a whole video on Chompa Rice. Um, he's only got three or four videos so far. He's going through the year, but um, his videos are okay. I mean, he knows what he's doing. So uh, those are some resources for you. I hope I think you've seen the PowerPoints that was from. There should be a PowerPoint on like all the topics and I like the way they were done. A teacher at. Denmark did those. Um, the PowerPoint starts off with a question or a learning objective 
and then walks through. And that's exactly how you should be studying. So there's a PowerPoint in one, 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 two, one, three. Those folders are listed in the resources for this week. Anything else? All right. Well, I'm going to turn the recording off um, and uh, hope you have a great week. week. What you're going to do is the Ibn Battuta thing where you use the my maps. The video should have explained that um, and submit that to me. You know, I'm a little behind on grading, so I plan on getting caught up this week. So thank you guys and Good luck on the test. Reach out through It's Learning um, if you have any issues, and I will see you next time. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you.